You're listening to the Mushroom Revival Podcast. So on this week's episode, we are talking about LSD. And for anyone listening who may not know, we're covering this molecule on a mycology podcast because it is a daughter compound of a special group of fungi. We talked about these fungi in last week's episode, so feel free to check it out if you are interested in its ecological roots. We are blessed to have yet again another expert who appeared in Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, who was once the only person in the United States allowed to synthesize LSD and has had a really influential role in psychoactive pharmacology. We bring you Dr. David Nichols. So you're a chemist, and it would be great to give your bio from your perspective of who are you? What what cool things have you done in this life? <laughs> okay. I started out in chemical engineering, didn't enjoy the math, quit after two years, um, didn't have much money, lived at home, and commuted to University of Cincinnati. Um, went to University of Cincinnati Evening College to finish my BS, took five and a half years, I worked in the chemical and biochemical industry in Cincinnati in the daytime during that that time. I then went to graduate school in 1969 and uh, stumbled upon a guy there named Charlie Barfneck who had not done anything on psychedelics, uh, which is what I wanted to work on, but hadn't been able to find anybody to do that. And uh, he started talking about projects he was working on and he said something about mescaline metabolites. And I said, oh, really? And we had a lengthy discussion and I had a fellowship, so it didn't cost him anything. So I decided to work for him and spent three and a half years doing work on basically mescaline analogs. We called them psychotomimetics then. Um, then uh, after I finished my PhD work in almost record time, I went over and did a almost two year postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Pharmacology. So I had a background in both chemistry and pharmacology and then went to Purdue University in 1974 as an assistant professor of medicinal chemistry and stayed there until I retired in 2012. Um, and in, in the latter part of my career at Purdue, I also uh, was named a professor of pharmacology. And actually, when I retired at Purdue, I was a distinguished professor of medicinal chemistry and also the Robert C. and Charlotte P. Anderson Distinguished Chair in Pharmacology. So I had did both chemistry and pharmacology, and I started uh, working on psychedelics, um, like I said, mescaline analogs, when I started graduate school in 1969. And I continued, I was funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse for just about 29 years. Uh, and that was one of my major projects. I also worked for about 10 years on MDMA, and also worked on some analogs of dopamine for a treatment of late stage Parkinson's disease and as cognitive activators in schizophrenia. So I had a broad background and then um, I also worked as a consultant and an expert in let, patent litigation for a number of pharmaceutical companies. So I had a real broad background from a teaching research. I, I had a number of graduate students and postdocs that worked in my lab, published a couple hundred papers, um, more than half on psychedelics. And so that's sort of a general background. So was mescaline kind of your introduction to psychedelics? What was your perspective going into that? Were you interested or was this just something that you were yeah. given to in, in college? And this is a great question because I, I, I actually spent the first couple of years of my life in Cincinnati. And it's not, you know, it's, it's a hip city, but it's not like some places in California, you know, in the in the 60s where it's super progressive. So did you, in earlier in your life, did you have a, an introduction to psychopharmacology or was this just happenstance? Nothing was happening in Cincinnati. Um, if you know Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati, there was a street called Calhoun Street and there were some sort of uh, head shops that were set up there that made custom leather work and um, bongs and things like that. And uh, Cincinnati was very conservative, and when they realized there was kind of a hippie commune in Calhoun Street, up in or in Clifton uh, Avenue, maybe um, they shut it down. They de they declared all the shops were fire hazards, and they shut them all down. So there was nothing really in Cincinnati. Not much of a music scene. Um, so it was a really conservative place. And I graduated from high school in 1962, and I had several friends that went away. 
to school at University of Kentucky. And as I said, I lived at home because my parents couldn't afford to send me off, so I, I lived, lived at home and commuted to University of Cincinnati. So they came up and visited on weekends because it was about a one-hour drive down to Lexington where the University of Kentucky was. And they would be talking about, uh, you know, a reefer and uh, LSD and acid and things that I really didn't know anything about because the newspapers also didn't cover much on the, in the way of those stories. So they were talking about smoking reefer and a reefer, what's that, marijuana? And, and then I, I'm talking about acid and LSD had just hit the campus. And so I got a book, a used book on pharmacology and started reading because I was concerned that they were going to get become addicted. And uh, I got a book on pharmacology and I started reading about marijuana and I thought, oh, this stuff is really pretty benign. It doesn't, it's not addictive and it's been known and it's more of a political thing. And then um, mescaline was something that was fairly easy to synthesize and I figured out how to do that and made some samples of mescaline and I actually had taken one or two doses of that at, at one point in time. But basically uh, became very interested in the fact that these substances had such powerful effects on the mind and, and, and the way you perceive things. And I thought these would be really interesting to work on. And then I started uh, doing some research in the scientific literature and found some papers published by Alexander T. Shogun uh, from uh, Shogun Drive in Lafayette, California. And he had published a paper in 1969 called Structure Activity Relationships of One Ring Psychotomimetics and it was a summary of all the work he had done, essentially modifying the structure of mescaline. So I knew that paper kind of chapter and verse. And I went to University of Iowa. I didn't go there to work for Charlie Barfneck. I went there to work for Joe Cannon um, because he had been working on some drugs related to atropine, which disrupt consciousness pretty dramatically. That was the closest I could get to the field. No one else seemed to be doing any chemistry that I could find. And so I had a fellowship. It was called a National Defense Education Act. Title IV Fellowship. At that time, they were promoting STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. So I had a basically a free ride, and that, that came with some money for lab supplies and for your mentor. And so um, Joe Cannon told me that even though we corresponded, I could work for anybody I wanted to work for in the department. It was a very small department. So there were only two other people to interview besides Joe Cannon. And so when I interviewed um, Charlie Barfneck, he had students working on um, uh, try and isolate some oral contraceptives from a plant and had another student who was working on some anti-inflammatory substances. Then he had this other student who was working on these quote-unquote mescaline metabolites. And mescaline is really not metabolized. And so he started telling me about each of the projects he had and he talked about the student who was doing the mescaline metabolites and I knew everything on the subject so I was kind of finishing his sentences. So he got kind of excited and I had a fellowship. It wouldn't cost him any money for me to work with him. And plus he gets some money for office supplies and so forth. So uh, unbeknownst to me, he was right there in that little department and uh, was just perfect for me. And so he said, yeah, you can work for me. And because I'd been putting myself through evening college and I had worked in industry in Cincinnati for five and a half years, I was used to being very productive because industry, you come in at you know eight and you're done at five, so you have to get all your work packed in in those hours. You can't stay over, you can't work weekends. So to me, um, graduate school was kind of a breeze. Imagine I, w I went to school every, four nights a week for five and a half years, taking a full load in evening college to finish my bachelor's degree, working at the daytime, in the daytime, and plus I had a, a baby son that was born in 1967, so I had a family. So that was kind of uh, pretty much of a, a struggle to keep, you know, burning the candle at both ends. So going to graduate school to me was kind of like a vacation. I just had to take a couple of courses in chemistry, which I loved, and do some research, which I also loved. So it was just a breeze for me. I just had a lot of fun. And Charlie Barfneck, um, he realized I had a lot of lab experience. And so he basically just let me kind of craft my own project. I'd go in and say, what do you think about this? And he'd say, oh, yeah, it looks like a good idea. And then I would do that. Well, I published a lot of papers as a graduate student and, and really had a lot of fun. It wasn't much of a stress. It was really kind of much more fun than it had the previous five and a half years had been when I was working all day and going to school all night. Yeah, you seem like a true academic trailblazer in terms of psychoactive pharmacology. 
And once upon a time, you were the only person legally allowed to synthesize LSD. Can you speak to the legal status of this now? And before you, uh, were people, where were people getting this? Were they asking Sandoz or another lab? So um, I started graduate school in the fall of 1969, and the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 was passed. And so that made everything illegal. And it was kind of funny because I had made all these mescaline analogs that Sasha Shogun had reported, and we just had them in a drawer. They weren't locked up or anything because they weren't illegal. But we had to get a little permission slip signed because the ethanol, the ethyl alcohol we used in our research was not taxed because it was a nonprofit institution. And so we could go down to the stock room and get ethanol as a solvent to use in our chemi chemical reactions. And we had to get these little cards signed to take down to the stock room. And I, I mentioned to Charlie Barfank once, I said, this is funny. I have to get a card signed to buy ethanol. And I have this drawer full of mescaline analogs upstairs in my lab that are just like sitting there. But um, in graduate school, I didn't have to worry about it so much. When I started at Purdue, um, by then you had to get a you had to get a controlled substances license, so I had to get a license for everything that I worked with. So mescaline and a compound called STP, um, MDA, um, and ultimately LSD. So you you could get the license to do it, <clears throat> and nobody had really uh, worked on LSD for many years. The mescaline and some of the, the phenethylamines like Sasha Shogun had made were fairly easy to make in the lab in just a couple of chemical steps. To make LSD you had to have lysergic acid. So in the very early years um, I wrote to the National Institute on Drug Abuse and they had a drug supply program and if you were a licensed researcher um, they would donate it to you and so I got some small amount of lysergic acid in the very beginning from the drug supply program at NIDA. Later on, I got donations of uh, 5 and then 25 grams of lysergic acid from uh, a colleague who worked at a company in Italy known as Pharmitalia. But I was allowed to make it because I had a, I had a license to use it, and then we had uh, trained uh, colonies of rats that ultimately we used LSD. And so we made, you know, 100 to 200 milligrams of LSD tartrate every year for most of the time I was at Purdue just because we had these trained rats. And they were the model we had to use for how these drugs work. We couldn't, obviously, couldn't test them in humans like Sasha Shogun had. Um, so we had rats that were trained to recognize the effects of LSD. We had them in a little, uh, uh, what's called an opera chamber that had two little levers in the front that they could press, a left lever and a right lever. And if they pressed the, what we called the correct lever, um, they would get a 50 milligram sucrose pellet, basically a little rat candy. And so we could train them. It took two to three months to train them. And if we gave them injections of LSD and trained them to press the right lever uh, when they got LSD, but press the left lever when they got placebo, um, they got very good. They would press the lever in 15 minutes, maybe 1,000, 1,500 times. And uh, we used that. Then if we made new analogs that we thought were psychedelics, we would inject the rats and see which lever they selected. And if they selected the lever that they'd been trained on with LSD, then they were basically were telling us, I think you gave me LSD. And that's, you know, that's a pale reflection of what LSD does in humans, but with respect to the potency, the amount it took, there was a nice linear correlation between the potency and our rat models that were trained with LSD and the human doses. And actually, I published a review in 2004 where I think I put that correlation in there. It was called hallucinogens. Were there any psychoactive compounds that you couldn't synthesize or either because of legality or um, you couldn't get the permit or it was just too complicated because it was a mixture of ingredients and then on the flip side were there any compounds that you made that you thought you know and still to this day you think could be really beneficial but were never really pushed out there and and used so any we could make pretty much anything we wanted to make and there were no restrictions because they weren't known compounds of course the, this was before the uh, controlled substances analog bill that was passed around the mid 80s when MDMA got real popular but prior to that the things that we were making uh, were really not controlled the things that Sasha Shogun had made weren't really controlled some of them were active we knew which ones were active we were basically making molecules and then testing them to see um, whether they were active or not. And all these molecules would have different three-dimensional shapes. Um, you know, 
flat things and round things and twisted things. So we were trying to understand what the, this was before anybody really knew what the receptor was. So we were really trying to probe, like imagine if you have a lock and you don't have a key for it, but you can cut a whole bunch of different keys and put them in the lock and some of them move so you can tell some of them move some of the tumblers and another one will move a different set of tumblers and not, yet a third key would move a different set of tumblers. And we do that whole thing, you find out, okay, if we cut a key that has these notches in it, the door will open. So it was kind of, that's kind of an analogy of what we were trying to do. Um, and we weren't really focused on therapy much at all until I started working with MDMA. And when MDMA got popular, um, I didn't think it would ever be possible to make it into a drug because it had come from the you know illicit drug scene. So my goal there was to come up with something like MDMA that had been developed in an academic lab and potentially could be developed as a medicine. And I worked in that for about 10 years, didn't really find much that, that was like MDMA. Um, and then I, I quit that work when it became clear that the only thing that the funding agencies wanted to support was understanding why MDMA might be toxic and why it, you know, people died if they took large doses of MDMA and danced all night in, the, in overheated rooms. And I wasn't really interested in that. I was interested in the neurochemistry. So I, I got out of that after about 10 or 12 years of having funding because I just didn't, wasn't interested in why MDMA was toxic. But we could make pretty much anything we wanted. In fact, I made um, um, MDMA for all the phase one and phase two studies that MAPS carried out. I made the high, you know, high purity MDMA for them. I made the DMT fumarate that Rick Strassman used in all of his studies and made the psilocybin that uh, Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins used for his first study and then for his later study in end of life patients. So the synthesis wasn't a problem. I just had to have a permit for anything I was doing and to get that permit with a schedule one um, controlled substance license you have to specifically list every chemical that you're going to use. You can't just say, I'm going to work with psychedelics. So I had 15 different things on that schedule. LSD and mescaline and DOM and 2CB, and 15 different things. And once you had the license, if I was working in a collaboration with someone, I could make it for them. So Rick Doblin at MAPS didn't have anybody to make it. He had checked the price of getting some high quality MDMA because he wanted to develop it as a drug and he needed to have a large amount to do animal toxicology studies and some early studies and so he couldn't he couldn't afford to make it so he came to me and said you know could you make it i made um two kilograms for uh the cost of the starting materials and i and my graduate students did it i think it cost him four thousand dollars and at a recent meeting he said he told me that the cost of one kilogram of gmp mdma which has been certified for human use, one, one kilogram cost him something wow. like $400,000. Wow. So, we, you know, he got quite a deal. And Rick Strassman, the same thing happened. You know, I encouraged him, I'd met him earlier, and I encouraged him to uh, do, do a clinical study with a psychedelic. And he wondered whether he could do it or not. And I said, yeah, I think you can because you're a psychiatrist at a medical school, you just need credentials. Because people had told, had told me, you can't do clinical studies, the government won't let you do it. And I just didn't believe that. You know, I thought you just need to have credentials. And the problem was there wasn't any grant support right. if you worked in this field. There was no money to do it. And so Rick Strassman said to me, you know, what if I get all the approvals and I get the protocol and everything's ready to go and I can't get the DMT? And I told him, well, I just made this MDMA for Rick Doblin, so I'm, I can make DMT for you. And that's what happened. He's written about a little bit about the story of how he, the hurdles he had to jump through. And then he got ready to do it, and then we made the DMT for that. So I enabled most of those early studies because there was no other way for like Rick to get MDMA or Rick Strassman to get DMT or so even psilocybin in quantities sufficient for clinical studies. Like what, So once you make it, do you ship it to them? Do you have to have some sort of you know person from the, the DEA supervise and and look over the transaction and actually be there in person i mean do you have to make it at their lab or do they you know, how, how does that work so in order to get a schedule one license um, you have to have your laboratory and your storage facilities inspected by the dea so um, i had a two inch thick oak door in my office and inside i had a safe 
that in addition to being locked also had um, a one inch steel bar that went down through some loops that were in the front of the drawers and uh, it was locked with a key lock so there was you know and plus there was another outer door um, that was a reception area where a secretary would sit so there were two oak doors they had to break through to get into my office and then they would have had to take a, a cutting torch or a hacksaw to hacksaw off the, ha the bar off of my safe and then break open the safe so you had to have a level of security so that had to be approved so after I made these substances I stored them in that safe and so when somebody wanted it um, of course when I first made MDMA it wasn't schedule one so I sent 250 grams to the laboratory that was doing the preclinical toxicology for MAPS and then that turned out to be more than enough and I still had uh, more than one and a half kilos left which I kept in my safe for a long time and I sent it to people once it became schedule one there's a form called a DEA 222 and that's the form you use to order and uh, to request samples of schedule one substances so that form has several I think two carbon copies under it you get a stack of those and if you want to if you want to get a schedule one substance from somebody even from an industry that sells it so if there's a company that sells LSD for example you would have to send them your DEA 222 and that lists your name your your physical address and also your DEA schedule one registration number so there's paperwork to do the transfer so then you would send you would send the request to them or they'd send a request to me then I would fill it out then I would send it via courier so you had to see couldn't send it through the mail I would send it through a courier and then you had to keep copies of the receipts for those transfers and then send those to the DEA periodically so there was a control mechanism to see who had requested it and when it was sent and where it was sent and who received it so there there is some paperwork now it's, it's worse now than it was it, and is it in like a stainless steel briefcase with like a handcuff to his uh, <laughs> wrist? Like I'm just trying to think of like a courier, like what, what does that look like? Well, they basically didn't know what was in those. Um, if you sent it FedEx or... Um, oh, it oh, was it was usually... like FedEx. It was not like a private... You just oh, wow. sent it through FedEx. <laughs> it, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, I was not expecting that at all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and of course it, it, they required a signature and... Um, and but DEA would send samples to me. You know, if I requested something from DEA, it would come via FedEx or one of the other couriers. Wow! So it would it would just be in a bottle that was sealed with a label and usually packed in with you know um, plastic wrap or you know this those plastic spongy peanuts and sealed up and wrapped in. Just have a label on it, so nobody really knew what was in there. And in most cases, even if it was diverted, it wouldn't be enough to really create a diversion problem. The DEA is mostly concerned about diversion of controlled mm -hmm. substance. Somebody getting a hold of them who doesn't, right. isn't supposed to happen. So imagine, you know, you have to have a Schedule One license to work with mescaline. And the dose of mescaline in humans is, and the hydrochloride or sulfate salt would be 200 to 250 milligrams minimum. If you want to work with 50 milligrams, which might be enough to do a number of rat experiments, you still have to have a, a, a storage facility a Schedule One license and a DEA inspection, even to work with non not you know non trivial or trivial amounts of the the compounds. So um, it wasn't really that big of a problem. And later on, they the DEA used to just read your protocols and then they would approve it. Then they added another layer. They brought the FDA in because then they would ask the FDA, okay, this person wants to work with LSD. Do you approve of what they're doing? So then the FDA would have to look at it and say, this looks okay or this doesn't look okay. And then they would tell the DEA. So it's kind of a paperwork hassle. And if you want to work with Schedule One substances, it's a hassle because, well, you have to have a safe. In New, in New York University, they had to get a safe when they worked with psilocybin in their end-of-life studies. And uh, Steve Ross was telling me they had it in this big safe that weighed 300 pounds. And uh, they had, I think, a total of one gram of something like psilocybin. And the DEA guy demanded that they take it out every day and weigh it in the presence of a witness to assure that none had been taken out, which is kind of just wow. really absurd. Yeah. But um, and then you had to get you to get the license. They had to get they had to inspect your facilities, inspect where you're keeping it. They had to have your CV. They had usually have a letter from the dean of your uh, school or department. Um, and then you re then you request the license. They send the DEA person out to inspect your lab and your storage area and everything. 
And then it can still take like six or eight months before they do anything. And I know, I think when Rick Strassman applied for his DEA Schedule One to work with psilocybin, um, it was like six or eight months and he hadn't heard anything back and they'd already inspected and he'd applied and everything. And he'd call and they'd say, oh, the guy who has to sign is out of the office. Yeah, we'll let him know you called. And this went on for a while. He finally talked to, the, I think, the president of the University of New Mexico where he was and they called and said, look, this investigator wants to do this study. We can't get a signature on this approval. And then it came through pretty quickly. Um, and I know another person who they came and inspected his facility and he waited six months or so and called and said, you know, what's going on? He said, oh, we can't find the paperwork. We need to come out and, and inspect you again. So oh, it's just, no. you know, a level of incompetence and interference that just creates obstacles. It keeps people from wanting to work with these. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're an academic and you're doing pharmacology or chemistry or, or say pharmacology, and you're in the lab and you think, boy, you know, I just had this idea for a really cool experiment. We could get this drug and not necessarily a psychedelic, but if it was a schedule one, they'd say, you know, we could do this study in rats or mice and uh, this might give us some background. We could write a grant. This would be really interesting. And then you say, oh, but we need a schedule one drug to do this. And you go, hmm, hmm. well, we can't do that because we've got to go through the paperwork and get the approval and have the and get a safe and the whole rigmarole. So people just they just don't want to do that. Plus, a lot of places have a fee that you have to pay. If you're a not-for-profit public institution, um, it usually doesn't cost you. But if you're at a private university, there's a fee for I think there's a fee for a couple hundred dollars every year to re-register. So it's it's a disincentive if you can't just pick something up and do it. You know, it's like if you're at home one day and you go. Gosh, let's go. Let's go take a ride in the park, you know, and and or go. Let's go rent a canoe and 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 paddle out on the lake. You can just do that. But if you're an academic and you want to work with a controlled substance, and you think, you know, I wonder what what if, you can't do it because you don't have a Schedule One license. And then they want to know exactly what you're going to do. So you're going to treat ten rats and you're going to give them a tenth of a milligram per kilogram, and the rat weighs two hundred and fifty grams, so that's four rats per kilo. So you need one milligram a tenth of a milligram for four rats and you want to use 16 rats so you request you know six milligrams of lsd plus 10 percent over for weighing errors and whatever and so you know it's just not it's just not something you can do you can't just write to a chemical company like virtually every other chemical intermediate you want and say hey i need to get 100 milligrams of this stuff can you send it to me so it's a disincentive so not many people wanted to work in that field plus there was no funding for it it was, you know, it was kind of the kiss of death working in that field. My son's a professor at Louisiana State University, and he wrote his first grant up, and it was all about figuring out how LSD works, and this has been like years ago. And I said, don't send that grant in because nobody cares. Nobody gives a damn how LSD works. If you want to use LSD as a tool to study something, you might have better luck. And, uh, you know, he didn't really have much luck anyway, but, you know, it was, you know, working on psychedelics, for somebody who was a psychologist or even a clinician for a long time was just the kiss of death in your academic career because you won't get any you won't get grant money and if you're an academic and you don't have grant money you can't fund your research and if you can't fund your research you, you'll be you won't get tenure and you'll be looking for another job in five years so it's kind of you have to be kind of nutty I, I mean I fortunately was able to get a grant a few years after I got to Purdue because nobody else was working on psychedelics um, and uh, that allowed me to work in that field, you know, and I, I just kept doing what I'd done as a graduate student and really didn't think a whole lot about it. And there weren't that many hassles until near the end of my career when they started getting more aggressive with their inspections and, you know, beefed up, I guess, the DEA, I don't know, when, with the drug war. Well, thanks for um, alluding to the bureaucratic headaches behind the scenes and for synthesizing all of these compounds for people to actually do some clinical trials and works. You're primarily known for synthesizing LSD, and I'm curious, as a chemist, the first time that you saw LSD, the structure of it, like what kind of thoughts came through your mind? Did, did the shape of it allude to anything that you previously knew? If you could just describe the experience you had with like actually seeing it for the first time. Well, um... Of course, I knew about LSD, and I knew about its history, and uh, I knew it was a sensitive molecule. Um, and when we decided to make it, um, the way you purify it is with a technique called column chromatography. And LSD is 
highly fluorescent. And so you run it down a column of aluminum oxide and elute it, and you turn all the lights out in the room and you use a, you use a long wave UV light. If you shine it sort of in the direction of the column, you see this bright blue fluorescent band, which is LSD, coming off the column. And it takes, on a big column, it takes several hours to get to come off the column. You just follow it moving down through this column until it comes off, and then you start collecting the fluorescent liquid that comes out the bottom. And then stripping off the solvent, and the first time I made it, I made the tartrate solid and gave these really beautiful needles of LSD tartrate. And so it was kind of cool to think, you know, that I was able to make it because it was a fairly tricky molecule. And we could go around the lab if we had made solutions of it or had prepared it or worked on it. You could turn all the lights out and shine the UV light around the laboratory and you'd see all these little blue fluorescent spots where maybe a drop of the solution had splashed out. So it was kind of uh, fun to work with it. Um, later on, I had graduate students who had made some under my, my direction. I'd say, okay, we need to make some, here's the way, and I'd you know, check to make sure that it was all, everything was fine. And I had one student tell me, you know, I don't know how Albert Hoffman really got high the first time in his lab because we were kind of sloppy when we made it, hoping we'd you know, get some solution on our skin or somehow get some in our skin. And I had a couple of students that, that worked with LSD and they said, we never could, that never happened. You know, we don't know how Albert Hoffman did that because he was such a careful chemist. Mm. So that's, that was kind of funny. Do you think there's some doctrine of signature there? I don't know if you've heard of this term before, but it's basically when something in the real world looks like the thing that it has action in, in the body. And LSD just being fluorescent and being this psychoactive chemical, it's, it's just kind of a, a cute coincidence or maybe there's something to the fluorescence. What can you say about that? Um, so when I was a graduate student, um, I made a whole bunch of mescaline analogs. And I made um, STP, which was a compound that Sasha had made in, it was in the Haight-Ashbury uh, area in 1967. And I was doing thin layer chromatography and, and illuminating the plates with a UV light. And I noticed that um, the DOM had a really bright kind of pinkish blue fluorescence. And so one, the first paper that I actually published was a correlation between the fluorescence intensity of a bunch of these compounds and human activity. So I made DOB and, and DOM and mescaline, and it was published. Um, and so at that point, we didn't, I mean, I didn't understand why the, the fluorescence could, could, could have anything to do with activity, but did notice an, a correlation between fluorescence and, and activity in humans. And LSD is by far much more fluorescent than any compounds that I had made. So it made sense to me that that high fluorescence was probably related to the, the activity of LSD. And there's a double bond in LSD in one position that if you reduce it and make 9,10-dihydro-LSD, the molecule is essentially rendered inactive. It looks chemically, it, it looks uh, almost the same as LSD, um, but it's not active and it loses its fluorescence. Hmm. So there's just something unique about LSD that it's, there are lots of things that, you know, quinine is fluorescent, but it's not psychoactive. Um, so I don't know that there's any significance in the psychoactivity, um, but it's just, it's just a peculiarity of the molecule. It's, it is highly fluorescent. And many of the early assays to quantify, you know, the amount that was in a solution or um, for analytical procedures, they actually measured the fluorescence and the fluorescence intensity of LSD as a method for analysis. So obviously we're super geeks about fungi, and so we're particularly interested in psilocybin and psilocin and, and LSD since they're derived from fungi. Um, and we actually just interviewed Dennis McKenna, and we're talking about how beautiful the compound of psilocybin and, and psilocin were um, as, as, you know, being so close to serotonin and also, um, DMT and how it's almost like the perfect entheogen. It's ready to go. It's ready to be absorbed. Right. Um, and it's, it, you don't have to really synthesize it in a lab. It's ready to go in, in nature, but you know, on the same school of thought, is there looking at the, the compounds of of any fungal psychedelic compounds compared to those from a plant or, you know, a toad or, you know, um, 
totally synthesized in a lab you know are there any differences or similarities that you see from the the fungal derived compounds well um, lsd psilocybin 5-methoxy dmt dmt they all have a tryptamine core in them that's a it's a it's a two ring system with a six membered ring fused to a five membered ring and then you have two carbons coming off with a basic nitrogen and some methyl groups attached like dmt a serotonin has a hydroxy in the five position. Um, psilocybin has a, an oxygen at the four position with a phosphate, but the phosphate is cleaved off in the body really quickly. So psilocin, the four hydroxy. So it's a four hydroxy dimethyltryptamine. Serotonin is a five hydroxy tryptamine. It doesn't have the dimethyls. And bufotenin would have two methyls there, so it would be kind of the analog. But bufotenin doesn't get into the central nervous system, so far as I know. Um, it doesn't seem to have psychoactivity. Um, so the indole core of those all looks the same. Um, but when you go to something like mescaline or uh, the non-synthetic uh, compounds, when you go beyond mescaline, it's not clear how those actually bind to the serotonin receptor. You know, you could see LSD, psilocin, 5-methoxy-DMT, um, you could imagine that they bind to the serotonin receptor because they look to some extent like serotonin, LSD is a big, trip, you know, big rigid tryptamine, but it still has, you know, the elements of what you might call serotonin built into the structure. When you go to the phenethylamines, and that's what I spent a lot of time trying to do because there were ideas published early on by some really well-known chemists, Salma Snyder, for example, who had said that mescaline bound because it adopted a shape like serotonin, and chemically it was quite unsound. He got it published in. Uh, I think proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences, which I just, I saw that and I thought, oh my God, this guy doesn't know any chemistry. And, and of course he didn't. He was a good pharmacologist, but didn't know any chemistry. But that was completely wrong. And so I spent a lot of time trying to define, was there a, a molecule you could make based on a mescaline core that looked in some way like LSD and that, that allowed it to bind? And it turns out that's just not true. They just bind in completely different ways. There are, you know, there are residues in the serotonin 2A receptor that engage the benzene ring of mescaline and also engage the, the indole ring of the tryptamines. And, uh, and you know, there's, an, there's a, a residue called an aspartate in the, in, the, in the receptor that interacts with the basic nitrogen. But beyond that, um, there's no similarities. It really... The only overall similarity between all of these would be an aromatic system, and in, in mescaline it could be one benzene ring, and in the tryptamines it could be this indole nucleus, but an aromatic system, two carbons away from a basic nitrogen atom, and that's a template that's carried in most of the biogenic amines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, they have that same motif, an aromatic ring, two carbons away from a basic nitrogen. And so, of course, the receptors and those transmitters have co-evolved to be compatible or complementary to each other. So that's the only common theme that you would see in those, but um, mescaline or DOM or these other molecules, they just don't have any, they don't bear any superficial resemblance to a tryptamine or to LSD. This might be a dumb question, but do most or all psychedelics bind to the serotonin receptor? All of the psychedelics, the classic psychedelics that we talk about, activate to a more a greater or less extent a, a receptor called the serotonin 2a receptor um, they typically also activate another receptor the serotonin 2c receptor and psilocin 5-methoxy dmt and lsd also activate the serotonin 1a receptor lsd interacts with a bunch of receptors not just serotonin receptors but also some dopamine receptors and alpha receptors so um, but the common theme is is activation of serotonin 2A receptors. And that's been demonstrated in receptor studies and animal studies and in humans, that if you use a drug that blocks that receptor, that binds to the serotonin 2A receptor um, specifically, then the, if you then put a psychedelic in there or you give it to a, an animal or a human, it blocks the effect completely. And that's been demonstrated in humans with both uh, psilocybin and with LSD recently a molecule known as ketanserin will block the effects of those drugs. So um, that's the primary target, and that, that's a really important. The serotonin 2A receptor is the most widely expressed G-protein coupled receptor in the body, and it does go back into evolutionary history. 
serotonin 2 receptor um, similar to the 2A <clears throat> exists in single-celled organisms and has been retained all up through evolution. So uh, in our brains, it's in the, it's in the cortex and the outer layers of the cortex where um, it's, it is one of the most important receptors in the brain for cognition and things like that. So um, I don't know if I answered your question completely, but... Yeah, I, it was amazing to learn about how far back that receptor went. All of our ancestors have this. Yeah, you can think about in evolution, if something works really well, nature usually keeps it. So this receptor must have worked really well in all kinds of organisms because it was kept up to the present time. <laughs> Indeed. And I want to revisit your lock and key analogy. So if this serotonin 2A receptor is the lock and all of these molecules are different keys, you spoke to how some turn different tumbles than others. Do you think or have we found a so-called skeleton key or some kind of molecule that will turn all of it and, you know, open up the consciousness to the whatever is behind there? So, um... It's an interesting phenomena with receptors. <clears throat> um, the serotonin 2 receptor, it's in a big family called G-protein couple receptors, and they represent the targets for about 40% of the marketed prescription drugs. So they're really Im important. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, these receptors, we used to think that when a drug bound, it just kind of turned the receptor on, and when the drug left, it turned the receptor off. That's not actually what happens. These receptors are proteins. Um, I don't know how much biochemistry you know, but they're, the proteins can exist in an alpha helical form. And these G protein couple receptors thread back and forth through the membrane seven times. So they're bundles of alpha helices. And they're flexible. So you normally have thermal motion, just Brownian motion, where they're kind of moving around and wiggling. And they can adopt different low energy shapes um, depending on you know, their, their shape. So there are several different shapes they can adopt. And these drugs can stabilize one or more of those. So LSD, a serotonin, a psilocin, a DMT, 5-methoxy-DMT, they all activate the serotonin 2A receptor, but they don't produce exactly the same shape when they bind. So imagine, if you will, you've got this like a bundle of sticks, like the receptors or alpha helices bundled together, and you put a, you know, um, <clears throat> a square object down in the top that f spreads the sticks out and changes their shape, or you put a round a ball in the top and that spreads the sticks out and changes their shape. So each of these psychedelics has a different shape. And so when it binds to the receptor, it may activate a different form of a different form or a different energy form of the receptor. And what happens is <clears throat> inside the nerve membrane where the receptor is bound, there are connecting loops because again, these uh, receptor proteins thread inside and outside and inside and outside, go back and forth like a long snake looping up and down. And so they have connecting pieces at the bottoms. So where helix one comes out the bottom, there's a piece that goes over to the bottom of helix two. It goes up through helix two, comes out the top of helix two to the top of helix three, goes down through helix three, comes off the bottom of helix three to the bottom of helix four, goes up helix four to the top, so forth. So it threads in and out and in and out. The, con the connecting loops on the bottom, when you change the shape of that receptor bundle, you change the way they arrange themselves, the loops inside the neuron cell change their shape. And there are signal generating molecules inside the cell called GTP binding proteins. They bind a substance called either GDP or GTP. And they're heterotrimers. That means they have three different things hooked together. So there's an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. And they're all associated with each other. And they can associate with the interior loop, one of these loops of the receptor. And if the receptor is activated, those G proteins will dissociate and travel to another part of the membrane and actually generate the signals. So depending on what the drug is that binds, those there are different G proteins. There are like 15 different G proteins. And depending on what the drug is, they can activate different signaling mechanisms. So 
although they all activate the 2A receptor, the actual signals they generate may be distinct in some way. And that's not really fully been explored yet, and the lab where I'm working now is actually using some fairly comprehensive techniques now to characterize a large library of different kinds of psychedelics and non-psychedelics, looking at which of these G proteins they activate and what other receptors they activate. So the activation of the 2A receptor may be a necessary but not sufficient condition for producing the effects that you see with a classical psychedelic. Um, so there may be other side effects or there may be more anxiety or uh, more kind of paranoia and things like that that would be associated with other, other signaling pathways being activated. It's hard to describe that without visually showing it, but I'm trying to give you some idea. I hope I, hope I did a decent job on that. So I'm imagining since this serotonin 2A receptor is in it's unanimous within um, animalia. If you were to give them LSD or something, it would bind to that receptor and something would potentially happen. Can you speak to this? Are people considering using psychedelics to test for consciousness? Obviously, the rats express some interest in the compounds, but how deep do you think this goes? Do single-celled organisms have an experience or do we just have no idea? Um, we don't really have an idea. Rats and mice... Um, presumably they have some kind of consciousness, dogs and cats. Um, when they gave LSD to cats, um, they would go into a rage. It was a rage response. The cats, you put a mouse into a cage with a cat that had been getting LSD, and the cat would freak out and try to get as far away from the mouse as he could. Wow. If you give dogs LSD, they go, <laughs> and you don't know what's going on in, in their mind. Um, but the consciousness studies, what's happened with the clinical studies and the resurgence of interest is a lot of um, brain imaging using uh, fMRI bold techniques or magnetoencephalography. They actually start looking at the currents, the network currents that are produced in the brain. And they're starting to understand a little bit more about consciousness by understanding what parts of the brain psychedelics turn on and what they do to change the electronic dynamics, if you will, of, of the brain functional networks. So that's where we're finding the most uh, out about consciousness by giving these drugs to humans, LSD and psilocybin, and psilocybin especially, and using brain imaging techniques. And there are a number of papers out published now looking at uh, what happens to, to brain dynamics when you put, it, put a psychedelic in there. But animals um, really don't have enough, you know, cognitive abilities, I guess. I mean, they. You know, they can choose one lever over another, or they can uh, they speed up running around in a cage, or in mice, they twitch their heads back and forth. But beyond that, you can't learn much about consciousness from anim any animal models that I'm aware of. So I'd love, I'd love to um, kind of dismantle a myth that, or, you know, um, uh, speak some truth on it, but I've, I've heard some stories of people, you know, some old hippies that took a bunch of LSD in the 60s, um, and there's a rumor that goes around that if you crack your back uh, too hard or something like that, you can get a dose of LSD, and I've heard that you can also test for LSD in a spinal tap. Um, how true is that, um, or is it just a, a, a fanciful myth? And can you detect it in a hair sample like I've heard? Yeah, um, first of all, with respect to your spinal fluid, that's complete baloney. After LSD is gone from your body, after whatever the half-life is, it's all diffused out. There's nothing left there. If you have a flashback or, or you know, HPPD, you know, the hallucinogen persisting, per persisting perceptual disorder, these are changes that have occurred in the way your brain structure works, but there's no drug left there. Um, and you could uh, analyze... I think you could analyze hair for LSD, but uh, what they typically do, you know, if you analyze for LSD in the urine or the plasma, a lot of times what they actually analyze for is a metabolite. Uh, in the body, LSD is, is oxidized in the liver, and there's a primary metabolite, OXO-LSD, that's formed, and they usually analyze for that. Um, but you can detect trace amounts, but typically, you know, they do that for people that are on probation and they, they're forbidden to use cocaine or heroin or whatever, typically they'll use hair analyses to find out whether somebody has you know, been violating the, con the conditions of their patrol, uh, parole. I don't recall that I've ever seen anybody rely on a hair test for LSD. 
but you probably you probably can test it, but it's not there in very large amounts. Obviously, the larger uh, dose of drug you take, the more the more easily you're going to be able to detect it in here. So going on more of a strange topic, uh, have you heard of trepanning, trepanation? Oh, oh yeah, Amanda Fielding. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. So she was part of that series that that you were a part of, um, and it blew my mind literally. <laughs> and it was the first time I heard of this this concept. And just diving in more research, it seems to be something that humans have done for a very very long time all over the globe, mm -hmm. and. It was interesting it's you know for anyone who doesn't know it's it's literally drilling a hole in your skull and the thought behind it was i think back in the day it was for headaches or for you know it was to allow the evil spirits to get out of your head if you had a headache or a pain they thought it was from an evil spirit and so if they made a hole in your skull the evil spirits could escape and um, i think amanda actually, uh dropped lsd yeah, had a, through the hole is that right oh my god no, she, she believed that psychedelics worked by increasing blood flow to the brain. And she believed that by doing trepanation, you would increase blood flow to the brain, which actually doesn't happen. She did a self-trepanation, as you know, and had a video of it. When we first became aware of her at the Hefter Institute back in the 90s, that video was, was on. And we said, you need to take that video down. People are going to think you're completely nutty. Take that video down. It was really kind of a bloody thing to watch her do that. And there's no evidence that trepanation increases blood flow to the brain, nor that psychedelics work that way. But that was her initial belief. When she started getting involved in this field, she wanted to support studies that proved that, increased, that psychedelics work by increasing blood flow to the brain. And she funded some studies to try to show that. And of course, they didn't show that. But that was her inner in entry into the field was this kind of you know, mystical belief that trepanation would increase blood flow to the brain and that would increase her level of consciousness. But I don't think there's, there's never been a study that's shown that. It was just, you know, kind of a thing that she did. Thanks for clarifying that. And um, it's interesting to, to show hard science. And I, I wonder if there any, is anything there, uh, since it is curious that many different cultures around the world have done it independently so maybe there is something there, but not sure exactly what it is. But yeah, another, there's, another. Th they're mostly primitive cultures that did that. You know, skulls from South America, for example, and some other places where they find they find the cranium, craniums or skeletons that have holes drilled in heads. And I think it, the thought was that they didn't have, you really didn't have medicine. So if you had a pounding headache, um, you know, with some demon was in there really trying to get out really hard, and so let's let's cut a hole. And those people, those uh, skulls healed over. So they know that whoever got uh, trepanation survived the procedure, but it seems to me like it would be really, and I don't know how many of them survived because, you know, infection would be really rampant unless they had some way to prevent it, which they didn't. So um, I think they were mostly primitive societies. And that was just a belief that she developed. So is there any way to increase the potency of psychedelics? To increase the potency. I mean, yeah, like hanging upside um, down, consuming vitamin C. I mean, I, I hear all kinds of like anecdotes, no, but... No, I, I don't think so. I mean, you're really talking about the amount of drug that's in your body that gets into your brain and the receptors that it targets mm -hmm. there. And you can't change that basic fact by changing vitamins or changing... I mean, you might change your diet. You might change, you know, the health of the, your brain physiology... Um, but there's no evidence of anything that works that way. I was in Germany at a, at a meeting some years ago, and uh, this guy came up to me, kind of a nutty guy, um, and he said he had gotten some supercharged LSD. And I said, supercharged LSD? He said, yeah, he bought some supercharged LSD, and I think it was on blotters. And I said, so what was it like? Oh, it was really powerful. It was the best LSD I ever took. And what did they do to supercharge it? And I says, they didn't do anything. You can't supercharge LSD. LSD is a molecule. And I said, but your belief right. that it was supercharged probably played a role in the effect because you thought, oh, wow, this is the best acid trip I've ever had because it was supercharged LSD. So placebo and your own personal beliefs can be very powerful. The placebo effect is really strong. I mean, placebos are, uh, have really good uh, analgesic pain-killing properties. If you give someone who's in pain 
um, a placebo tablet and say, oh, this is a new pain reliever that's been developed, a significant percentage of people will get pain relief from that. So your belief, you know, it's mind over matter. Your beliefs can really affect what you perceive. Right. And I think on a similar vein, you know, one case of people using psychedelics without much knowledge around it and and maybe it causes it to be a little dangerous is is n-bomb right so so it, that was something that i heard vice cover and i i think you had a part in in making it is that is that right yeah we i learned from a, a fellow who worked in rolfheim's laboratory in germany he sent me a copy of rolfheim's uh, a poster that he'd given at a scientific meeting and parts of his thesis where he had first developed these n-bomb compounds um, and stumbled on them actually accidentally. And we had a lab looking at the mechanism of action. We saw that, and they're, they're super easy compounds to make. So we made a whole bunch of them and then did um, molecular pharmacology, molecular biology, looked at the receptor, where we thought they, how, they, how we thought they bound, where they bound. Um, they're very potent. Um, last year, the lab where I worked published a crystal structure of one of the n uh, in the serotonin 2A receptor. And um, they're extremely potent because they push against, there's a residue in the receptor, a tryptophan 336. And the end bombs push over against that tryptophan and push it down. And that's one of the mechanisms for activating the serotonin 2A receptor. This particular tryptophan is part of what's called a switch mechanism. And so um, they bind to the receptor just like, you know, DOB or 2CB would, except that benzyl pushes off into another part of the receptor that pushes this activation switch, this tryptophan residue. So uh, they're extremely potent. No one knows why they're toxic. Um, I think probably it's a difference in metabolism because a lot of people have taken the N-bombs, but a fair number of people have, have died, but not as many as have taken it. And it's been shown that in the liver, there's one of the methoxy groups that's clipped off, cleaved off in the liver by an enzyme called a mixed function oxidase. And it's then uh, coupled to uh, glucuronic acid and excreted. And that, that happens really quickly. So if you look at in, in animal studies where they've administered these Enbo compounds, pretty, you see this uh, glucuronide formed really fast. And what I think is that uh, most people metabolize it quickly and they don't suffer these, you know, the lethality. But in some people, uh, we know that there's a lot of variability of those enzymes in the liver, and some people don't have the ability to take that methoxy group off, so you have the intact drug molecule, and it hangs around for a long time. It gets in the receptor and stays there for a long time, and we think that's somehow related to the toxicity of those substances. Why was the embalm created? Um, he was actually uh, trying to dissect drugs that block that receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor, and he was doing studies to figure out what part of that molecule was responsible for blocking the receptor. And he started uh, basically dissecting some known molecules that bound to the receptor but were inactive. And he got down to this minimal structure, which was an N the N-benzyl compounds, the N-bo compounds, and found out that they were really potent. So he wasn't even looking for these. He was trying to discover the part of the, these molecules that bound to the receptor and block the effect of psychedelics, not drugs that, that actually activated the receptor. So he came at it from a completely unexpected direction and just kind of stumbled on these N-benzyl compounds. And then, um, then we picked up on them and published, and then of course they got really popular because everybody started making them. And then because they were so potent, they could put them on blotters. So for a long time in, in some of the areas, like in the San Francisco Bay Area, a lot of people were getting blotters that were called LSD, but they really had end bone compounds. So was the point to create some kind of drug that could bring someone down if they were too high on psychedelics? Or like, what was the original intention for having this blocker? In medicinal chemistry, there, there's a process you use called structure activity relationship analysis. And that basically means you're trying to understand what about what is it about a molecule that makes it active? And in doing that, you modify that molecule by adding new pieces to it or by taking pieces off. And so it's kind of like a big puzzle. Uh, and you kind of take pieces off or put pieces on until you find out what's the minimal part of that molecule 
So with L LSD is a very complex molecule, but you may be aware that it has a tryptamine fragment inside the structure of LSD. So if we'd never discovered, if DMT, dimethyltryptamine, had never been discovered, someone could take the LSD molecule and start cutting pieces of it off till they got down to the tryptamine part and they would find out that that was active and so they would say well this tryptamine part is the functional part of LSD so he was taking drugs that blocked that receptor and trying to understand what was the minimal part that bound and if you know the minimal part then you can sort of look at the receptor and say what are those pieces interacting with in the receptor so he wasn't necessarily trying to develop a better a blocker or an antagonist. He was just trying to understand the structural basis for the ability of those drugs to block that receptor. Do you think it's fatal because these chemists are doing the procedure wrong and they're making something that is not the actual compound and 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 you know or using chemicals that are, that are toxic that are getting into the formula? Um, or do you think it's the actual compound itself or how people are ingesting it? I know I read some people were taking it nasally and, and it might be that ingestion that maybe is way too potent and they're, or is it they're taking way too much? There are a lot of variables. That I've seen cases of people who died from taking two or three blotters. So they were there was a larger dose there. But normally psychedelics are not lethal they're not you know nobody's died of an LSD overdose really um, so that doesn't seem completely reasonable to me that it was just taken two or three now there's another case where some people got some powdered Invo compound and uh, took too much there was a massive overdose and that killed some fellow some fellows I think in North Dakota um, but um, I think that it the pure molecule I think it's a failure of some people to metabolize it quickly and they're the ones that have died. But also, if this stuff is made from China, you know, you don't have the FDA in China making sure that these compounds meet their standards of purity. So if you get something made offshore, the Chinese make a big batch of it, and maybe it has got some toxic impurity in it. So it could be a toxic impurity, it could be overdoses, it could be related to people that don't metabolize it efficiently. So I think there are a combination of factors there. And of course, if you if you insufflate it, uh, put it up your nose, um, then it's going to hit you really fast. And again, uh, then it doesn't go through the liver at all. It goes right into your, um, your systemic circulation. And so the liver doesn't have any chance to break it down. So there again, if it's the intact molecule that's toxic by, uh, by blowing some up your nose, then you're avoiding the mechanism that would detoxify it. So any of these things could be involved. So moving to DMT which is a, a fascinating subject, specifically MAOIs, uh, these beta carbolines um, that block the enzyme in the liver that, that breaks down DMT. And, and I've heard, you know, we just interviewed Dennis McKenna, and he has a theory that DMT is, although not proven, he, he thinks it's in pretty much every single plant. Um, and he, he said he wouldn't be surprised if it's in every single plant. Uh, are the beta carbolines are they just more rare um and it's you know that that's why we're not you have, tripping every time we eat a salad yeah and 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 why you know uh, for ayahuasca there's two different plants that have to come together um and you know what would happen if you you take a beta carboline supplement and went about your day uh would you have more intense dreams when your body naturally produces dmt or um, yeah, what would happen if you just took the beta carboline as, as a supplement? To my knowledge, beta carbolines do not have any effect. They were investigated as anti-Parkinson drugs way back maybe in the 30s or 40s because they blocked the degradation of dopamine. And Parkinson's disease is a deficit of, of dopamine. So they were trying to increase dopamine levels by taking uh, beta carbolines. But uh, as far as I know, beta carbolines, you know, you don't produce enough DMT in your body to really have an effect, even if you block the breakdown um, by giving an MAO inhibitor. Other MAO inhibitors um, are commercially used as antidepressants. So they were, uh, they were first developed, I think, probably back in the 50s or 60s. Um, and they, they prevent the breakdown of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine in the body. 
Um, and so they're used as antidepressants. So beta carboline might be, might have antidepressant effects, but you don't have enough DMT in your body for it to build up and affect any in the physiology. You'd have to really get, um, you know, I wrote a paper on this. I gave a talk on this at Breaking Convention. You really need about a 25 milligram dose of DMT to have any kind of, you know, have those effects. And uh, you just can't produce that much in your body. It's a big controversy because it's really a popular uh, meme that uh, DMT is produced, you know, at the moment of death and it's produced when you dream and, and all these other things. There's no, there's really no evidence for that at all. Wow. Cool. I'm curious if you've ever looked at the mirror images of these molecules and studied various chiralities in the psychedelic realm. Yeah, in fact, my first patent was when I was a graduate student. I patented the method to make the, the optical isomers of psychedelic amphetamine derivatives like DOB wow. and STP. MDA. Um, yeah, you know, the body is made of L amino acids and only L amino acids and not there's no D amino acids. Um, and so your body is really a big stereochemical everything. Everything in your body is, you know, is of one type of stereochemistry. So if you imagine um, these stereo, these stereoisomers are kind of like gloves, a left handed and a right handed glove. Um, and your left hand fits into the left-handed glove, but not into the right-handed glove. And so if you think about drug isomers being like left and right hands, and the body being just like a left-handed glove, only, or, the, or only a right-handed glove, only one of your hands will fit. It's because that all the receptors are made of L-amino acids. So all the targets for these drugs are L-amino acids. So there is a stereochemical preference, LSD, um, has a two stereochemical centers, one at the five position, and it's only the one where the hydrogen is in what would be called the R configuration that's active. If you make, um, and it's plus LSD, if you make minus LSD, and that actually was made by uh, Albert Hoffman at Sandoz, and the first method that he used to make LSD, um, it, made, it gave a mixture of the plus and minus L LSD, and they examined the L LSD and it wasn't active at all. Big, large molecules that have stereochemistry like that, typically only one of them. There's so many natural products out there um, that are toxins, and they have specific, you know, more than one, often two, three, four stereocenters. And because of the targets in the body all being made of L amino acids, usually only one of those will fit. And of course, the enzymes that the plants use are all L amino acids too, so they're making only one form of, of these compounds. Mm -hmm. So the ergot alkaloids, only the, only the plus ergot alkaloids are made by the ergot fungus because their enzymes are all L-amino acids, and so they make only one form of the drug. Don't drink the mirror milk, right? <laughs> that was something Lewis Carroll mentioned in his book, uh, Through the Looking Glass, where he stated that looking glass milk wouldn't be a good idea because perhaps he was aware of the ambidextrous universe and how like mirror images of compounds can be destructive in our bodies. Because, as you stated, our metabolism is modeled for a handedness within certain compounds, and if you were to give it the mirror image, it either wouldn't bind to those proteins or, you know, some, some other destructive behavior would unravel. But coming up on our time here, and I want to make sure we get to some listener questions. And our first question is... Is LSD difficult to make, and how much lab experience does one typically have to have before they have the skills to do it? Um, the trick to making LSD is getting either lysergic acid or ergotamine, which is a naturally occurring ergot. If you have either one of those, um, it's pretty easy to make. A lysergic acid can be coupled with diethylamine, and there are now some modern reagents that are really safe, and the coupling goes really fast. So if you could get lysergic acid, you stir it in a solvent in the dark. You have to protect it from light because it is sensitive to light. You put it in a solvent like dichloromethane, stir it, put in lysergic acid, diethylamine, and throw in, there's a, there's a coupling reagent you can use. And the reaction is done in 15 minutes. And you uh, put into a, a separatory funnel, wash it with water, and evaporate off the solvent. And then typically you might purify it over column chromatography. Um, it wouldn't take very extensive uh, equipment to do that, but you would have to have lysergic acid as a starting material. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but it's, 
it's you know it's a one it's really a one step synthesis. If you had ergotamine, you treat ergotamine essentially with lye. You cook it up with lye, and then you that breaks off the everything except for the lysergic acid, and then you could isolate the lysergic acid. That's a little bit messier uh, because it tend, lysergic acid and ergots tend to uh, oxidize and turn dark uh, in air, etc. But then you purify it with column chromatography, and a lot of that stuff is, is cleaned up. So it's not that hard. But the issue is getting the starting material, getting lysergic acid or an ergot. And both of those are watched uh, items. If you try to order a bunch of ergotamine, the DEA will probably come knocking on your door. Another listener wrote in and he said that after a very large dose, 1,000 micrograms of, of LSD, he felt like he didn't want cigarettes anymore. And I've heard of a lot of studies of alcohol addiction with LSD and then cigarette addiction with, with psilocybin. Uh, has there been any research with LSD with, with cigarette addiction? Um, not yet, but I think all addictions probably have the same kind of root. Um, the, in the early days of uh, LSD research, treating alcoholism was one of the big things where the most attention was focused. And actually, there was a meta-analysis done a couple years ago by a Scandinavian a couple where they went back and did a meta-analysis of all the studies that had used LSD to treat alcoholism. And each of the individual studies were not powerful enough, you know, to do to do a study like that. You need a lot of you need a lot of subjects, and you need a long follow-up time. But they showed that there was a significant effect of LSD against alcohol use in those early studies. And they really weren't designed to. They were. They just gave it to them, and there wasn't really much therapy to go along with it. The studies of uh, nicotine and alcohol use disorders that have been done recently by Matt Johnson, Johns Hopkins, and Michael Bogenschutz, now at New York University. In those, they both have therapy before and after. And so you really prime people to think about their addiction, you know, to think about their life, why they, why they drink, why they can't stop smoking. And that's part of it. So then you take the psychedelic and there's some kind of an increased cognitive awareness, something happens. And that's really the task for psychiatry to figure out in the future how these things actually do what they actually seem to do. So, I mean, it's a really exciting time. It's 50 years overdue, in my opinion, but at least it's happening now. Yeah. In Hamilton Morris's uh, Pharmacopoeia, you were featured, uh, there's a section that was kind of sliced in there of him asking you about you having to destroy a lot of the compounds that you made and asking if that hurt, you know, as an artist to, to destroy um, uh, your the compounds and, and you responded that you had to pour them down the sink with a witness and things like that. What what compounds did you have to destroy and, and why? So the ones that were Schedule One that I was able to, to transfer, I transferred to uh, other people who had Schedule One licenses for those compounds. And there weren't very many. I had some LSD that I transferred to a company um, MDMA, I transferred all to MAPS, um, and uh, if there were, there might have been some others, but basically, uh, you they were either burned if they weren't controlled substances, or if they were controlled substances, they had to be uh, washed down the sink, and someone had to witness you destroying them. So yeah, that was uh, when I retired. I had big libraries of compounds that we'd made over the years that you know might have had interesting properties, but. Uh, they had to go, you know, down down the toilet or oh, whatever. Oh, sad. <laughs> and and what about the procedures? Are are those accessible by people? Can they remake those molecules, or did you have to destroy those as well? Yeah, we published all our work and all the exact synthetic uh, details are in all those publications. So if anybody was interested in anything that we did, yeah, we we could uh, we could have a ma- they could make it. From Rachel in Austin, Texas, and she wants to know. How do you feel about putting patents on synthesized versions of LSD, similar to what Compass Pathways is doing with psilocybin? And if it's used medicinally for trauma, do you, like, what are your thoughts on the ethics of withholding that part of nature that could help so many people? So um, the patents follows pretty much the standard pharmaceutical industry um, procedures and practices. If you consider that there are literally hundreds of millions of people out there who need treatment for depression, addictions, etc., I'm not sure how you do it without getting funding from investors. 
and getting funding from investors depends upon you having intellectual property, which means a patent. So Compass wouldn't have been able to, to get all the investors they've got without having patents. Now, their patents don't really protect much in that case. Psilocybin can be manufactured by different methods. Different uh, polymorphs can be formed. You can make different salts. So I'm not sure that really prevents um, these substances from being used. I'm not, I, I don't believe that the Compass patent prevents anyone from using psilocybin. And LSD, um, there's only really only one way to make LSD, and um, it would be very difficult to patent it. And, uh, and even if you did, people could still make it. So I'm not as concerned about patents as some of the people are who believe that these should be available for anyone to use for, you know, for any reason. So I'm less concerned about whether or not these are these patents are, are produced. The patents do mean that if there's money to be made, that there will be incentive, incentives by these companies to develop more robust procedures, maybe develop even new drugs that are even better than the ones that we have. So money, as you know, drives our capitalist economy. And I think without, without the patents, there won't be the investment. All this flurry of new companies, there's something like 600, more than 600 entities trying to make money in this space now. And they're not all going to survive. You know, a few are going to survive because they don't understand how much money it costs to do, say, a clinical trial. If someone develops um, a psilocybin analog and they want to do a clinical trial, the clinical trial is going to cost between 50 and $100 million. Where is that money going to come from? And the money comes from investors who see a company that has a new idea or a new way to use psychedelic therapy and so they invest because they, they expect a return on their investment. So it's kind of a complicated issue. It's not just really people are patenting these things and so nobody can use them. That's just not the situation. Um, so if we really, I think if we really want these medications and medicines to be used widely, globally, there almost have to be patents because patent protection for your product or your approach um, really is the thing that attracts investors. And that's the case for every, you know, every publicly owned company in the world and in the United States. So I don't think the patents are keeping these from being developed, but rather are ensuring that investors will come in and support this because there is a great need for these medicines. And I don't see any way that they're going to get out to people. You, you can't treat 100 or 200 million people if you don't have money coming in from somewhere. And you can't just charge the patients because they don't, they're not going to have, they're not going to be able to afford the therapy. So it's, it's a, it's a, kind of a, touchy and difficult situation. But I'm not that concerned about the patents. Thanks for that insight. And I do believe that patents aren't inherently bad. And if it's done by the right person, it can actually be a good thing. Because it'll protect itself from you know other people coming in making it restrictive. But some people can patent, so nobody else does that, right? So, yeah, I think there's. There's hope to, to do it the right way. Yeah. I mean, Compass tried to patent, you know, the, the comfortable furnishings in the room and the use of eye shades and earphones. That patent, in my opinion, will never be awarded. It's because it's in the common, it's in, it's in the common public domain. There's prior art out there. You can't patent something that's been known since the 1960s and everybody uses that. So they've tried to get broader patents, but I, I don't believe the examiners will allow those, pat that, those parts of the patents. If you could see the future of this industry or, you know, it, are there any, is there any research that you're just dying to see done or do yourself um, that you think could pave the way for, for this space? Well, I think the psychedelics are proving to be a very useful tools in understanding brain function and how the brain generates mind. Um, you know, they've had, they have modern imaging techniques now and technology, you know, fMRI and magnetoencephalography and, and F, you know, all these brain imaging techniques, which you can look at a normal brain or you can look at a, a diseased brain and you can see differences. But with the psychedelics where you have this kind of expansion of awareness, this, you know, increased level of insights and introspection and it's activating parts of your brain that normally are not activated. 
they're, they're able to pick that up with the brain imaging. And so I think, um, and the real trick is understanding what to look for and having software that's sophisticated enough to really figure out what's happening there. So in the future, I think there, first of all, I mean, I think I would accept that we're going to see people treated for depression and anxiety and, and lots of disorders, some addictions, maybe eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder. There are a lot of things where the dynamics of the brain are disturbed and I think psychedelics can fix that. And the other side of that coin is that in, in fixing those problems, coupling that with brain imaging is going to give us a much better insight into how the brain actually works, you know, what personality is related to, what personality disorders are related to, and it's really going to help us understand fundamentally more about who we are as human beings and, you know, why we are the way we are. Well, thank you for all the important contributions that you've made. We are so thankful to have gotten the opportunity to speak with you. Immense gratitude for David's time, his expertise, his impact on this field, and for all of our beautiful listeners tuning in and trooming in. You can support the show and keep content like this coming by visiting our website, mushroomrevival.com, and purchasing any of our products. And if you are a listener, which you are, by listening right now, you get a special discount for 10% off. Just enter MR Podcast at checkout. That's all capital letters, MR Podcast at checkout. You can also support us by rating and reviewing. These go a long way, and we always appreciate feedback to help us improve our content. Please keep spreading the spores. Tell all your friends, your family, your coworkers, everybody about mushrooms, the show, and how they can form a sacred relationship with fungi. And as always, mush love, and may the spores be with you. Thank you.